Okay, now this looks like a busy slide, right? So um, uh, don't get too uh, worried about it, but this is the concept of the new Exchange 2007 roles, right? So for the Exchange 2007 roles, what happens here is that um, you now have five different roles. So I'm just going to quickly show you how they work, right? Now, first thing is, let's say that somebody on the internet sends you mail content, right? That mail content is going to go through your outer level firewall. It's going to hit your, uh, again, this is the demilitarized zone. It's going to hit this first exchange role called the edge transport, right? It doesn't have to be deployed, but it's just an additional layer of protection. So when it hits that edge transport, it, it is able to do uh, things like uh, routing and hygiene and so on. This, by the way, is also where you would install forefront security. Okay, and that would take care of things like you know antivirus, anti-spam, and, and so forth, like we've talked about. Then the edge transport um, server would pass on that content through to the hub server. Think of the hub server as basically like a routing server for email, right? Both internal and external email, which is important. And it can also do uh, policy type of um, uh, rule configurations on the hub transport server as well. Then that particular hub transport, transport server figures out if the content is for um, mailboxes that are stored here. If they are, then this is the mailbox role. So that stores the actual mailboxes and the public folders as well. But what might happen is that you might have um, on on the remote wide area network, you might have another site out here, and this site might have an exchange server. Uh, and if it has an exchange server, and obviously that's the mailbox role, which is the equivalent of this. Okay, but again at a separate site. So what we're going to need to have at that site also is a hub transport server as well. So for example, if this internet email is destined for people over here. On, on this particular site, then it's going to flow perhaps through your corporate headquarters, hit the edge transport, flow through the um, internal network, and then basically head off through to this uh, remote hub server. And then of course through to the mailbox server. Okay, so um, we, we that's how we get to the actual mailbox. And then we've got two other uh, little ovals here. The first one is the client access. So for this, this is, if you like, what used to be called the front end server in Exchange 2003. So in other words, as people on the internet, which by the way would go through both firewalls before coming here, um, when they hit this particular client access server, this is the server that runs the Outlook of Access engine if you like, it runs your internet access protocols for mail and so forth, and then this client access server in turn would then communicate with the mailbox role. Last um, here is the unified messaging role, and this unified messaging role uh, basically handles voice, um, uh, as in voicemail, it handles faxes, and it basically interacts with your existing um, PBXs or VoIP systems and fax systems um, in order to, to get all that content um, merged up, okay? And obviously that's going to be talking through the mailbox server as well. So it's a bit of a messy slide, but uh, really the, the key thing is to uh, remember that there are five roles. Um, if you had a simple exchange installation, you might have, for example, just those three roles on the one box, which would be okay. Okay, You may not have, you may, or want perhaps, unified messaging, and you may not have deployed the Edge Transport server. Um, perhaps you don't even have a DMZ, perhaps, I, I'm not sure. So that's perfectly viable, um, but there are many ways of configuring this as well. Okay, that can actually be on the same server as I said, or you could separate this off onto a separate box because again, it's going to be perhaps locked down from a security perspective much uh, more intensely than this guy because it's basically being accessed by people from the internet. Okay, so the security protection might be a lot stronger. So therefore, you might want to separate that off. Okay, another scenario is that um, for uh, whoops for your mailbox role, it and if you want to run continuous cluster replication, 
in order to have high availability of that over through to another mailbox role server, then um, these basically have to be isolated. So in other words, if you're running clustered uh, continuous replication, you can't have these roles on the same physical box. Okay, it's not supported. So like I mentioned before, there are a number of rules and so forth that you need to follow and suggestions um, in terms of uh, the architecture for this type of deployment. Okay, we're almost done. Um, now we'll just uh, touch on licensing and then we'll just do a wrap up. But uh, the key things to remember here is that um, on the Exchange Standard Edition um, license, we uh, there is no support for single copy clusters. So in other words, this is what used to be called server clustering. Okay, so that's not supported with the Standard Edition. Just like with Exchange 2003, there's no change there. Uh, clustered continuous replication is also not supported on the standard edition. It's only supported on the enterprise edition. Okay, basically both of these things um, you know, use clustering technology, and therefore to use clustering technology, you need the enterprise edition license of Exchange. So that's not anything new. That's uh, very very similar through to the Exchange 2003 model. Obviously, clustered continuous replication doesn't exist in 2003, but it's a form of clustering. Other than that, um, the, the differences here are obviously from 5 to 50. Okay, so that's a big jump over here. So you can scale an enterprise uh, exchange server much, much more than you can an exchange system. Um, there's one little gotcha though, and that is that if you do want to do clustered continuous replication, um, this only supports one uh, database per storage group. Okay, so if you've got your storage group, you've got a database supported, all right? But if you've got a storage group and you've got many databases in here, if you wanted to do clustered continuous replication, you're only really going to be able to do high availability for one of them. So keep that uh, in mind when you um, design your systems. Client access licenses. Um, this is a bit of a strange one because the model has changed. Now, if a standard cal basically gives you normal type of functionality. What I mean by that is, you know, access to all of your email and calendars and contacts and all that, Outlook Web Access and Exchange Active Sync, right? So this is, you know, mobile messaging. But if you wanted to get through to any of um, these other features here, all right, so we're talking about unified messaging. So this is concept of voicemail and faxes. Um, uh, per user or per list um, uh, journaling, uh, managed folders, exchange hosted filtering, or full front security, you're going to need an enterprise cal, right, which gives you this. But notice that the enterprise cal does not give you this, right? So what do you do? Well, you've actually got to get both, right? So if you want these services, what you're going to need to do is get both the standard cal, which will give you these, and the enterprise cal, which will give you those. So you need both a standard and an enterprise cal in order to get access to those services. Okay, so that's a little bit strange, uh, a bit of a different path from Microsoft. 